world news tonight. Growing concerns. Omicron variant of COVID-19 now spreads to 23 countries. Back to restrictions. Nations requested to consider mandating vaccinations as fears rise. Gateway plan. EU launches a 300 billion euro bid to challenge Chinese influence. Time to shine. A beloved holiday tradition awakes New York this Christmas. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with the updates of the COVID pandemic. The United States identified its first known case of Omicron, discovered in a fully vaccinated patient who traveled to South Africa as scientists continue to study the risks the new COVID variant could pose. So this is the first confirmed case of COVID-19 caused by the Omicron variant detected in the United States. The first known U.S. Omicron case has been found in California, U.S. health officials announced on Wednesday. The patient, who was fully vaccinated but did not have a booster shot, has mild symptoms, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci, the top U.S. infectious disease official who briefed reporters at the White House. The individual was a traveler who returned from South Africa on November the 22nd and tested positive on November the 29th. The individual is self-quarantining and all close contacts have been contacted and all close contacts thus far have tested negative. For days, U.S. health officials have warned that the new variant, first detected in Southern Africa and announced on November 25th, was likely already in the United States as dozens of other countries also detected its presence. The profile of the molecular profile of the kinds of mutations that you see would suggest, A, that it might be more transmissible and that it might elude some of the protection of vaccines. But we don't know that now. We don't know what the, what the, what the constellation of mutations are actually going to be. We have to be prepared that there's going to be a diminution in protection. Fauci said it could take two weeks or more to gain insight into how easily the variant spreads from person to person, how severe it is, and whether it can bypass the protections provided by vaccines. President Joe Biden on Wednesday repeated that the new variant is a cause for concern, but not a cause for panic. Biden said earlier in the week the country would not go back into lockdowns and promised to lay out his strategy on Thursday for combating the pandemic over the winter. In Japan, too, new restrictions have been imposed and the nation fears the worst with the spread of Omicron. Now we have, other than a World News Special Correspondent, Rasida Chandradasa, who joins us now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasida, what's the latest update in Japan? Well, Shanali, the Japanese government announced a total ban on all inbound travel effective from November 31st midnight. And this pretty much bars anyone visiting Japan for a business, leisure, student, or even working visa. While this, the clarity on the spouse visa and few others are still questionable, there's no doubt that the Japanese government under the new Prime Minister Kishida Fumio want to make strict, strict, very strict measures to, to control the corona situation, which is drastically reduced uh, compared to Western countries because we are having cases uh, less than 100 for past few past few weeks. So the government also restricted the uh, the Japanese airlines, both the JAL and the ANA, to bars any new bookings. And they have promptly agreed and they have put a notice on their website saying that anyone who's willing, who wants to book any new tickets would not be able to do so. And this is a very questionable decision because most of the Japanese nationals living abroad who are expected to visit Japan during the holidays. Japan, unlike other countries, have a long uh, Christmas and a New Year holiday, which is which goes around for a week or so. And many Japanese nationals, this is the best time, this is the time for the year that they usually travel to Japan. So this decision made by the government was questioned in the local press. And Kishida Fumio, the prime minister, announced today that they would they are going to uh, see some of the, they are going to uh, release some of the restrictions and would allow the 
than Japanese national citizens who are living abroad to travel Japan during this month. And he also put a cap into this inbound travel and he put about 3,500 per day. So this new Omicron uh, Corona variant has not just impacted the travel, it is impacting the Japan stock market as well. Uh, the two big airlines, the JAL and the ANA, had uh, their stocks dipped around 20% in the past couple of days. As, as well as the stock market in general has dipped a uh, few days uh, from its peak last week or week or so. While in Japan there are no locally uh, affected uh, uh, Omicron variant, uh, there's, a one, there's one news says that the Namibian diplomat who recently traveled to Japan from Namibia he was uh, tested positive for this new COVID variant and he's under treatment and self-isolation. And also the local news uh, says that over 70% of the South African uh, COVID testing, uh, so South Africans who are tested for the new COVID are from this Omicron new variant. So Kishida Fumi as the new, pro uh, new Prime Minister, he would want to take strict measures controlling the numbers in Japan because he would know Unlike his predecessors, controlling the corona would obviously help him to uh, control the government and create the stability. Over to you, All right, thank you. That was Adi Teruna World News Special Correspondent Rasta Chandra Das reporting from Tokyo in Japan. The European Commission's top officials said it was time to think about mandatory vaccination as the fast-spreading Omicron variant darkened forecasts and deepened fears of another difficult winter. As pandemic restrictions like indoor mask wearing were reintroduced in Portugal, long lines at vaccination centres also returned. The country is ramping up efforts to jab the few people who haven't yet had their shot, as well as give vaccine boosters. It's just one more and if we need another, I'll take it. What we need is vaccines for everyone. Almost 87% of Portugal's population is fully vaccinated, yet it's seen a constant rise in COVID-19 cases over the past two months. It's a trend in many European countries, one that could worsen with the presence of the Omicron variant. Urging countries to remain vigilant, the EU's top official also encouraged discussions on making vaccines compulsory. One third of the European population is not vaccinated. These are 150 million people. This is a lot. I think um, it is understandable and appropriate to lead this discussion now, um, how we can encourage and potentially think about mandatory vaccination. Austria has already said it will make COVID-19 jabs compulsory next February, while Germany is considering following suit. On Wednesday, France lifted a ban on flights from 10 southern African countries, but said only French and EU residents will be allowed to disembark. Upon arrival, the passengers must take a COVID test and go into quarantine for seven days or 10 days if the result is positive. Brussels has announced plans to raise up to 300 billion euro to counter China's infrastructure spending around the world. The money will help to poorer countries build highways, pipelines and broaden networks. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Inuka Ponza reporting from Cleve in Germany. For more, Inuka. Yes, Shanali. The move is a response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, a massive collection of infrastructure projects across the globe that has served to fortify Beijing's foreign policy and soft power. Named Global Gateway, European Enterprise is meant to bring in the necessary investment to manage worldwide challenges such as the fight against climate change and security of supply chains. The scheme promises to promote high social, environmental, fiscal and labour standards. EU Commissioner von der Leyen didn't specify which projects will be supported but named some potential ventures like clean hydrogen, submarine data cables, transport links and schools. Global Gateway faces an uphill battle to outweigh the Belt and Road Initiative. China launched its Belt and Road project in 2013 to boost trade links with the rest of the world and has been spending heavily on the development of infrastructures in dozens of countries around the world. But EU officials say financing offered by Beijing is often unfavourable not transparent and makes some poorer countries, especially in Africa, dependent on China through debt. Back to you, Shanali. 
Thank you. And that was Adi Darina World News Special Correspondent Inuka Ponza reporting from Cleve in Germany. Iran has started producing enriched uranium with more efficient advanced centrifuges at its photo plant dug into a mountain, further eroding the 2015 nuclear deal during talks with the West on saving it. Just as talks aimed at reviving the Iran nuclear deal are underway, the International Atomic Energy Agency has announced that Tehran has started enriching uranium to up to 20 percent purity and using more advanced centrifuges to do so. This at its Fordo plant, which is embedded deep inside a mountain near the city of Qom. Iran has downplayed the report, but the head of the IAEA said the developments were of concern. Iran has been restricting the IAEA from inspecting its nuclear facilities, effectively using inspections as a bargaining chip, according to analysts, in order to gain more leverage. Iran's gradual abandonment of its commitments under the 2015 deal has sought to raise alarm in Western countries, applying pressure to have sanctions lifted. Under the accord, the purity to which Iran could enrich uranium was limited to 3.67 percent. But Iran is now enriching to higher levels, from 20 percent to 60 percent. While below the 90 percent needed for a nuclear weapon, Western powers are concerned about Iran's growing stockpile, which now far exceeds the accord's limits. In Vienna, Iranian negotiators are now demanding relief from U.S., EU and U.N. sanctions as a condition to revive the agreement, which fell apart back in 2018 when U.S. President Donald Trump withdrew from it. Iran maintains that its atomic program is only for civil purposes. It's going to a short commercial break. You're watching World News. We'll be back soon. Welcome back. The European Commission is facing backlash after it proposed to give Poland, Latvia and Lithuania more flexibility to process asylum applications. Serious concerns about migrant rights has emerged as the European Commission presents its new proposals on asylum seekers. The EU is giving temporary and exceptional flexibilities to Poland, Latvia and Lithuania, the countries caught up in the Belarusian instigated migrant crisis, in order to allow them more time to process legitimate claims while returning migrants that have no legal basis to remain. It will give the opportunity for Poland, Latvia and Lithuania to have a longer period for um, the registration of the asylum, asylum application to clarify uh, where they have to be uh, 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 special points for the asylum application and that is possible to direct people to those points. Poland is still refusing to allow entry to journalists, humanitarians or EU agencies who need to assess the dire conditions people are living in. And according to NGOs, today's proposals, which also allows the three countries move asylum seekers to camps where they can be detained for over 16 weeks, don't deal with measures that target the suffering of those trapped at the Belarusian border. So far, over 1,800 people not eligible for refugee asylum have been returned from Belarus to Iraq. While Commissioner Johansson admits innocent human beings are trapped, the EU says a hardline approach is needed to give a strong message to Lukashenko. The heads of Joint Chiefs of Staff from Seoul and Washington reaffirmed their strong alliance. The United States has restated its commitment to providing extended deterrence. This came during their first face-to-face -face meeting since 2019. The U.S. Joint Chief of Staff Chairman General Mark Milley on Wednesday stressed Washington's commitment to Seoul as well as its continued commitment to providing extended deterrence. The top U.S. military officer made the remarks during the 46th military committee meeting with his South Korean counterpart, Won in -chai. Extended deterrence refers to U.S. stated commitment to mobilizing a full range of military capabilities, conventional and nuclear, to defend South Korea against potential aggression from North Korea. The two sides said in a joint press release on Wednesday that the military leaders were briefed on the security situation on the Korean Peninsula and in the region, which could have included talks on the North's recent military activities and Washington's moves to keep Beijing in check. The two also acknowledged the progress in the Allies' discussions on the envisioned transfer of wartime operational control. 
Wednesday's annual defense talks in Seoul were the first in-person session since 2019 due to the pandemic. Won and Millie underlined the importance of carrying out the meeting face-to-face -to, -face to demonstrate the strength, credibility and flexibility of the alliance. The 53rd Security Consultative Meeting will also take place on Thursday, where SARS Defense Minister's Hope and his U.S. counterpart Lloyd Austin are expected to discuss the Afghan transfer, as well as the joint efforts to secure peace and complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. A Michigan teenager was ordered held without bond after being charged with first-degree murder in the deadliest U.S. school shooting of the year, which killed four students with wounding seven other people. Michigan prosecutors have charged the teen suspect in this year's deadliest U.S. shooting as an adult. Ethan Crumbly, a 15-year-old high school sophomore in Oxford, Michigan, about 40 miles north of Detroit, was charged with first-degree murder and a slew of other criminal counts on Wednesday. Crumbly opened fire on his classmates earlier this week, killing at least four students and wounding several others. Oakland County prosecuting attorney Karen McDonald spoke to reporters on Wednesday. We are charging this individual with one count of terrorism causing death, four counts of first-degree murder, seven counts of assault with intent to murder, and 12 counts of possession of a firearm and the commission of a felony. Authorities say Crumbly used a semi-automatic handgun, which his father had purchased four days earlier. Sheriff Michael Bouchard said officials have found no link between the suspect and the victims. The sheriff said school officials had contact with Crumbly the day before the shooting and another meeting with him and his parents the morning of for concerning behavior in the classroom. The sheriff told CNN on Wednesday that Crumbly intended to kill people, saying he fired at least 30 shots at close range, often aiming at people's heads and chests, and added, quote, it's just absolutely cold-hearted murders. The community held a vigil Tuesday night for three of the students killed. The fourth died on Wednesday. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison said he had asked the country's Minister for Education to temporarily step down during an investigation into allegations of an abusive extramarital affair. Australia's Minister for Education is under investigation following allegations of an abusive extramarital affair. Alan Tudge has temporarily stepped down from Cabinet after being accused of physically and emotionally abusing a former staff member. He has strongly refuted the claims, saying the relationship occurred in 2017 and was consensual. During parliamentary questions on Thursday, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said the issue was being dealt with. Given the seriousness of these claims that have been made by Ms Miller, it is important that these matters be resolved fairly and expeditiously. To this end, the Minister has agreed to my request to stand aside while these issues are addressed by my department through an independent and fair process to ensure that the matters that have been raised can be properly assessed. The affair allegations come just days after a landmark report found sexual harassment was rife in Australia's federal parliament. More than half of the people who responded to the inquiry said they had experienced at least one instant of sexual harassment bullying, actual or attempted sexual assault. Morrison is under pressure to address parliamentary culture ahead of an election due in the first half of next year. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea has one of the longest subsea road tunnels in the world. After more than a decade of construction, Boryong Undersea Tunnel finally opened to the public. Heavy rains that triggered floods and landslides in central Vietnam have left at least 18 people missing, some feared dead, with houses destroyed and roads damaged. Drop in air quality in New Delhi pushed pollution levels into the hazardous category, making it difficult for people to step out of their houses. The United Nations appealed for $41 billion to provide life-saving assistance next year to a record 183 million people worldwide caught up in a conflict and poverty led by a tripling of its program in Afghanistan. A U.S. labor group has urged the federal authorities to investigate Amazon on its real number of COVID-19 infections at the workplace as the e-commerce giant was accused of providing misleading or grossly incomplete data.
And finally, tonight, crowds return to New York City's Midtown Manhattan for the 89th annual lighting of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, officially kicking off the holiday season in usual fashion. This year's event was open to the general public in contrast to last year's gathering that saw strict COVID-19 restrictions as virus infection cases soared. The two-hour ceremony was broadcast live with a slew of star-studded performances, some virtual, including Carrie Underwood, who pre-recorded performance of the song Let There Be Peace was broadcast from Nashville. The night's highlight came when more than 50,000 multicolored LED lights and a 900-pound star with at least 70 spikes covered in 3 million crystals were switched on, bringing the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree to life. This year's tree will be on display through early January 2022. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.